Welcome, everybody, to uh, the first uh, physics research conference or a physics research conference or colloquium of the new year. Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Jack Harris from uh, Yale. I've been kind of following his stuff for uh, many years, and I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping this new topic is going to be another one that I follow. Uh, Jack is an expert in all kinds of things related to condensed matter physics, quantum optics, quantum measurement, and of course in uh, liquid helium optical mechanics. And I think it's a these days all of us who are interested in things like uh, quantum measurement and maximum quantum information extraction of devices. When we see this phrase non-Hermitian operators or non-reciprocal systems, we get very excited to think something is going to happen there. Uh, whether it is or not, I don't know. Uh, but this, I think it's very, if you've looked into it a little bit, it's a really interesting topic. You can see from the fact that we have people not here uh, just from the physics department, but there's even people here from math, which is unprecedented maybe for our uh, physics here in the um, So I think I'll, I'll have for intro. Uh, welcome, Jack. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so thanks, uh, Rana, for the introduction, for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at Caltech. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I, let me start out by saying, uh, again, it's a huge pleasure to be here. The project that I'm going to be telling you about is a close collaboration between my group and my theory colleague at Yale, Nick Reed, and his graduate student, Judith Fuller. I also want to, in my own group, particularly uh, single out uh, research scientist Yogesh Patel for really making these experiments work. Um, in Rana's kind introduction, he claimed that I had all this expertise in lots of different fields, which is debatable. Um, so in light of that, I'm uh, going to admit right up front that the topic I'm going to be telling you about today is not about quantum optics or condensed matter physics or AMO at all or particle physics or cosmology or biophysics or any of those things. Okay? I'm going to be telling you today about a project in mathematical physics, which uh, is weird because I'm an experimentalist, and this is not a natural thing to happen, uh, but the mathematics that I'm going to be telling you about is literally part of our everyday practice as physicists, whether we're theorists or experimentalists, part of what we do every day. Um, and so uh, having made that claim, uh, let me test it, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if, from time to time, you have to find the eigenvalues of the <laughs> okay, so you are in this community, like we're all part of the same community. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be telling you about uh, a particular bit of interesting mathematics, uh, which we could regard as just sort of interesting on its own right. Uh, hopefully it will be at least a little bit interesting. It's a bit of mathematics about polynomials and their roots, the solutions to polynomial equations. Okay, um, and its connection to physics um, is that uh, well, there are a lot of ways in which this happens, but I'm going to be thinking about classical mechanics. I'm going to be thinking about the physics of classical harmonic oscillators, coupled, linear, the simplest physical system that we know. It's called trivial for uh, a reason. And uh, if you take just one thing away from my talk, uh, what you should take away from is that this very familiar ubiquitous system of coupled classical oscillators, quite generally, not for some special crazy experiment or uh, exotic parameter regimes or anything, quite generally, have uh, spectra that contain knots and that contain braids. And in particular, if you have a system of oscillators and you start tuning them with whatever parameters you have at your disposal, you will find that that system's degeneracy lies on a knot. And you will find that quite generally what you're doing with the eigenvalue spectrum is tracing out a braid. That's the story that I'm going to tell you about. Eventually, we'll get to doing some experiments just to show that this is, is real, and maybe I'll talk about some potential applications. So uh, my claim is it's very simple math, very simple physics, but some real surprises in it. The uh, simple uh, math that I'm going to tell you about uh, is polynomials and their roots. And the claim that I will make is that as you look at higher and higher order polynomials, does anyone know how to make that go away? Thanks. Um, so if you think about solving a polynomial equation, let's just start concretely. Here's a first order polynomial in the variable lambda with some arbitrary coefficient A. I know how to solve this equation. I know how to solve this equation. It's just minus A. If you are uh, tasked with a uh, second root, and then that 
Um, yeah, so if you were tasked with solving a second order polynomial equation in that same uh, variable lambda, um, here's uh, with some arbitrary coefficients a and b, here's the solution. We probably all memorized this in high school. This is just a quadratic equation. Uh, as required by the fundamental theorem of algebra, it gives you two answers. There's a square root here, so there's plus and minus. It's a two-valued function that corresponds to those two um, solutions to the equation. Let's try this one more time. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if you have a fourth-order polynomial, there's a, a, a third. Sorry, if you have a third-order polynomial, again, there's a nice formula for it. It involves cube roots as well as square roots, and it will give you three answers. This is a three-valued function. You go to fourth order, again, a perfectly nice formula that involves cube roots and square roots and the like. Um, if you go to fifth order, it's no longer possible to write this uh, expression in terms of radicals, but there are simple functions that we know well, hypergeometric functions and elliptic integrals that give nice complex an analytic uh, solution to this problem. And it's a five value function to return you the five roots. And at sixth order, it's the same deal, seventh order, eighth order, and so on and so forth, as high as you go. So what I'm going to be telling you about today is the following statement. As you go to higher and higher order, there is a sudden dramatic change in the character of these solutions, one, and two, a sudden dramatic change in the character that is important for fixed physical systems, for ubiquitous physical systems. And if you were to look at this chart and say, well, where is there some sudden dramatic change in the character of these solutions? I will forgive you if you imagine that it was right here. Okay, this is a famous break, and it is a, a qualitative change in the character of the solutions, um, where you go from being able to write them in terms of radicals to not. But as important as a mathematical result of this is, I'm not aware of any physical consequence of it. I'm not aware of anything that I can do as an experimentalist to measure something that uh, is influenced by this. Okay, uh, if you're interested in this kind of math, you might know that it's for polynomials above seventh order, they play an important role in the uh, Hilbert's 13th problem and the approach taken to it by uh, Kolmogorov and Arnold. Again, very interesting math, not relevant to physics as far as I know. The giant dramatic transition uh, that I'm particularly interested in telling you about happens right here. When you go from second order to third order, these solutions change uh, their characteristic such that um, in their solutions, you will have structures like knots and braids that I mentioned on the first slide appearing quite generally. And furthermore, that these structures do have tangible, measurable, important physical consequences. Okay, what are those physical consequences? Well, the physical consequences that I have in mind is that if you take n oscillators and couple them together, their resonance frequencies are given by a formula like this. The resonance frequencies are the roots of an nth order polynomial. So for concreteness, if I have two masses and they're coupled by linear couplings, springs and the like, or if I have three or four or five or six, and I write down F equals MA to describe this, it's not hard to convert this equation into a form that looks like this, where X is a uh, N component uh, vector whose real parts are the positions of the objects and whose imaginary parts are their uh, momenta. And its time evolution is generated by a matrix. This is known as the dynamical matrix. And it's just some list of the springs and masses. Okay. And when we solve such a problem, all we do is we find the eigenvalues of this matrix, and those are the resonance frequencies of whatever system it is that we're talking about. So that's why the problem of finding roots of polynomials is related to these physical systems here. Okay, and that's going to turn out to be why it is that these structures are physically relevant. I should say I'm completely happy uh, to take questions or uh, to be interrupted at any time. Um, yeah, so the uh, what I'm talking about are the resonance frequencies of the normal lows. And what I will tell you is that uh, such systems, when n is 2, uh, have none of this topological structure. But for the case of 3, 4, 5 coupled modes, they have this interesting topological structure. There's one caveat to that, which is all these nice mathematical statements really only hold if we're solving over the complex numbers. And that's when these formulas uh, are sort of naturally applicable. And uh, that may or may not be physically relevant or physically meaningful. Um, so now let me explain to you sort of situations in which it is. This is the equation whose solutions we're interested in. This is describing our physical system. 
Um, this equation is so ubiquitous. As far as I know, it doesn't even have a name. That's when you know you've made it, right? Elvis, Madonna, just one name. This equation has no names. Actually, it has many names. So if you are doing quantum mechanics of a closed system, this is the Schrodinger equation for an n-level system. If you are doing classical mechanics for coupled oscillators, this is Hamilton's equations for those oscillators. If you're doing circuits, at least with capacitors and inductors, this is Kirchhoff's law. If you're doing sort of any linear wave system, it's uh, an n-mode system. If you're doing open quantum systems, your Lindblad master equation will be in this form as well. Lots of situations in which we use this equation, and so we're interested in its properties. So here are uh, the three points that I want to make here. The first is that if you're working in an application where D is strictly Hermitian, like closed quantum mechanical systems, I have nothing new to tell you. Nothing uh, will emerge from this problem. Uh, but in a lot of these cases, it's perfectly natural for this matrix not to be Hermitian. I'll talk about that later, but certainly in, for the Lindbladian or for uh, Newton's laws. And then the last point is that if you're used to thinking about this equation in the context of Hermitian uh, dynamical matrix, there are just some giant surprises when you uh, broaden your horizons. So some of those surprises are related just to the properties of matrices themselves, not to like this differential equation or anything. It's just a little bit unfamiliar if you learned, uh, let's say, linear algebra in the context of quantum mechanics to work with matrices with complex eigenvalues, or in which perturbation theory is really very different. The topic that I'm going to be talking about today is this one, uh, in which it's the eigenvalue spectrum acquires some topological structure. There are also some differences in the evolution, uh, in the you know time evolution described by this equation that result when this matrix is not Hermitian. Like there's no adiabatic theorem, you can have non-reciprocity, things like geometric phases work out uh, rather differently. Uh, my talk is going to be mostly about this one. And these surprises uh, are interesting. Um, at least that's my hope. They're also super useful just because of the breadth of application of this mathematics, right? Whether you're working in the microwave domain or the optical or the acoustic, there are a lot of situations in which you have coupled oscillators uh, and you might be using them for any of these applications. So in particular, uh, I'm just gonna ask you to have in mind uh, the classical mechanics of uh, coupled oscillators described by this equation of motion where the time evolution is uh, characterized by uh, an n by n matrix here. Now, if these elements are perfectly lossless and reciprocal, if they really just consist of masses and springs, then this matrix will be Hermitian, sort of all the things you think about in terms of quantum mechanics hold. But if you say, well, what uh, in Newton's laws, what uh, forces are naturally allowed? What linear forces are there? They're ones that are proportional to um, velocity, if you like, or the couple. Uh, velocities and positions and non-reciprocal waves, which you could think of as these discrete elements here, um, then this matrix can be any complex matrix. So which is just to say that classical and Newtonian mechanics and classical electricity and magnetism naturally talk about systems in which this matrix is any complex matrix. There's no uh, symmetry required. Yeah. You're not allowing velocity to dampen. I, I am. So uh, this is meant to be viscous damping. Or resistance. So D can depend on X and X bar. Oh, uh, so everything is linear. Everything is linear in either X or P. All your forces. Oh, so uh, okay. So when you write out your differential equation, it'll have X, it'll have X dot, X double dot, etc. But no power is involved. Um, okay, so given that that's the case, the spectrum, the resonant frequencies, are determined by the characteristic polynomial of this matrix, which in this case would be a third order matrix, third order uh, polynomial. And it does care about all of these nine elements, but those nine elements get folded into just these three coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. So once I know these coefficients, that's it. The spectrum is calculated directly from them as the roots of. Uh, of this polynomial. And again, because you have this freedom for making any matrix that you want here, these coefficients can be any complex numbers. And so what I'm gonna be telling you about today is what happened to the eigenvalues, the roots of this polynomial, as I vary these coefficients. Okay, if I give you the coefficients and you have to find the roots, there's some program that will do that for you very efficiently. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is how the roots depend on these control parameters. Uh, so maybe I'm going to hide this uh, this window again. 
Okay, so um, here's that uh, characteristic polynomial again. Put that up here. Um, and it's specified by its uh, coefficients, as we just said. There will be n of them, n complex numbers. It turns out that uh, often we don't care about the trace of the dynamical matrix, so we can get rid of one of these. So at the end of the day, the characteristic polynomial of an n-mode system involves n minus one complex numbers, or if you like, twice that many real numbers. And so the space of all such spectra, the space of all control settings, is just uh, r to the two n minus one. That's a pretty boring space. It's just two n minus one dimensional space. And so what I mean by that is that uh, if I think of some point in that space, that specifies all of these coefficients, specifies a characteristic polynomial. Equivalently, it specifies the n eigenvalues that live in the complex plane. Okay. So what I want to ask is what happens when I take those control parameter settings and I start to change them? And in particular, what happens if I change them in a manner that traces out smoothly a closed loop in this space returning to itself. If I do that, one thing that I know is that at the end of that loop, parameterized here, I have to have exactly the same spectrum as I started. So I'm literally solving the exact same polynomial. So these things have to come back uh, to themselves. There are also some nice results that tell us that uh, the intervening evolution has to be smooth. If this is a smooth path, these will all evolve smoothly. Uh, and also, we know that if I consider a slightly different evolution through the control space, I get a slightly different evolution of these eigenvalues. So here's one possible way that that can play out. And this is, uh, here I've deliberately drawn a very small loop so that none of the eigenvalues change very much. But suppose I take a big loop, a giant loop in this space, coming back to the same spot. I start with the same spectrum, I come back to the same spectrum, but the eigenvalues are going to wander around all over the place. They still have to evolve smoothly, and they still have to come back to the original spectrum. But they could accomplish that in this manner here, in which you see each uh, eigenvalue isn't being smoothly transported back to itself, but this entire set is being smoothly transported back to itself. This is the main point that I want to tell you about. Okay. So uh, as you smoothly change parameters, you should expect your eigenvalue spectrum to trace out an object like this, which is known as a braid. If you consider some different path, again, like a very different path, you, your uh, strands might result in a completely different braid. You notice this red one is completely different, topologically distinct from this blue braid. Okay. So um, at this point, this is now the origin of why eigenvalues braid under the uh, action control loops. But it would be reasonable to ask, why does this uh, blue loop give me this braid, whereas this red one gives me this braid? These braids are topologically distinct objects, but these two loops can be smoothly deformed into each other. They don't look topologically distinct. Okay, so to see uh, what's actually making the difference between this blue braid and this red braid, let me just use PowerPoint to force this red braid to look like this blue braid. Okay, so here it comes. I'm just gonna push those strands until they look just like this. I'll go back and do it again. And I'm also pushing the control loop until the red control loop looks like the blue loop. And you can see that to transform this braid into that braid, I have to force these two strands through each other. That's how I change a braid topology. Doing that means that at that instance, two of the strands are in contact with each other, which means that two eigenvalues are equal, which means that what I am doing in deforming a loop from this red one to this blue one is it has to pass through a point of degeneracy. So the topological feature that distinguishes one kind of control loop from another is how it wraps around a degenerate point in this control space, just by construction. Um, this is not quite right, because in this three-dimensional cartoon space that I've drawn, a single point actually can't topologically distinguish two loops. Okay, but that's okay, because degeneracy is explicitly one complex constraint. It's the two complex eigenvalues equal each other. This is two real constraints. So it specifies a curve, uh, so to speak, of two dimensions less than the full space. So in this cartoon, I really should have drawn degeneracies as being some kind of family of, the, of two dimensions less than the full space. And I guess if this blue loop produces a different braid than the green loop, there should be another family of degeneracies that runs through here. 
So the takeaway is that every loop in the non-degenerate control space that avoids the degeneracies makes a braid of eigenvalues. Okay, and and uh, loops that uh, are topologically distinct in this space make topologically distinct braids. So that's kind of the qualitative map that I want to tell you about. Um, um, next, though, I want to admit that this is really just a cartoon. And I don't really know exactly what any of these shapes really look like. So that's what I would like to puzzle out next. Again, quick recap, you're dealing with some kind of polynomial. The only thing it cares about are its coefficients. Um, the space of those coefficients is perfectly boring, but it has two subspaces that we're interested in. It has all of its degenerate spectra, which live in two dimensions less than the full space. And we're interested in control loops and how they wrap around uh, this hole that's left by carving out the degenerate uh, spectra. Okay, so if I want to understand uh, what all these loops are doing, what I'm asking for uh, is a catalog of all of the topologically distinct types of loops. That's going to tell me what kinds of braids I can make. And it turns out that that's a very famous way of characterizing a given space. At least it's famous if you're an algebraic topologist, uh, algebraic geometer. Um, and this is what's known as the fundamental group of that space. It's a classic way for characterizing um, loosely speaking, the shape or geometry or topology of the space. So let me now introduce that as a topic, this fundamental group of a space. Let's start with a space that we all know, three-dimensional space in this room. And if you draw a loop in this space, or you draw another loop or another loop, they can all be smoothly deformed into each other and all collapse down to a point. So we say that this space has only one kind of loop, uh, and so its fundamental group is just a trivial loop. Here's a space that's topologically a little richer, right? the surface of a sphere. However, if I draw a loop on the surface of a sphere, I can always contract it back down to a point. So as far as the fundamental group goes, the sphere is no different than R3. Um, we don't have to hunt much further to find something a little more interesting. Here's the plane with a hole at the origin. And now if I start drawing loops, I will find that loops are characterized by an integer that tells me how many times it has wrapped around that hole. And we know this as the winding number in this space. For every loop, there is an integer. Um, now I have to admit that this thing is called the fundamental group for a reason. It's not just a list. It's also a list with an operation. And for characterizing spaces in this way, is the operation that we care about is what happens when I take two loops in this space and make a new loop out of them just by concatenating them. That's the operation of this group. So here's an example in which I started at this black point and I do the uh, blue loop first like this, and then I do the red loop and I make this purple thing, which is still itself a loop, but it is made by doing these two in order. Now, if I think about this purple loop, I can smoothly deform it and smoothly deform it until it goes away. So this purple loop has winding number zero because it's topologically equivalent to this, and zero is simply the sum of these two winding numbers. So in this space, the thing that characterizes the loops simply adds when you concatenate loops. This is not generic. So here's a space with two holes in it. Um, I think about this red loop and this blue loop. If I concatenate them by first doing loop A and then loop B, I can get it to look like this. But if I do these loops in opposite order, first loop B and then loop A, this loop cannot be transformed into this one. So this is a space in which loops do not commute. Doing loop that's A, B is not the same as doing loop B, A. So loops are not characterized by a number and arithmetic with that number. Uh, they're characterized by a word in a two-letter alphabet. Um, and uh, as a result, since these things don't, uh, the generators don't commute, this fundamental group is not abelian. And this is what we are going to find is happening in harmonic oscillator systems with more than two modes. So again, a quick recap, in those toy examples that I gave, we could draw, we started with a picture of the space and then kind of figured out what is the fundamental group. What we have in the situation that I'm telling you about is the opposite. I, I drew you a cartoon that is totally not correct. What I started out with though was information that every loop in the space of non-degenerate spectrum corresponds to a braid. For every loop, there's a braid. That is the fundamental group. So that tells us that uh, the fundamental group of uh, the non-degenerate space, the space with the degenerates carved out of it, is the braid group on n elements. Okay, so that's now listed up here. 
If you're tuning your oscillator system, you have some uh, trivial Euclidean space. And within that, you care about two of these spaces, the space of degeneracies and the space where you move around. Its fundamental group is the braid group, which happens to be non-abelian for n greater than two. But I still would like to draw you a picture. What are we talking about? Is it a donut with another donut going through it? Or like, what, what is this space? Um, and I wish there was some clever way of uh, extracting what the space looks like from its fundamental group. But as far as I know, there just isn't. So we'll do a brute force calculation. So suppose I have a two mode system. Here is the characteristic polynomial of a two by two traceless matrix. Z is an arbitrary complex number. So my control parameters are its real and imaginary parts, which is to say the complex plane. It's not hard to figure out where the degeneracy is. That's just when Z equals zero. So here's the degeneracy. The non-degenerate control space is everything around that whole. So this is a case that we talked about. The non-degenerate control space is the plane minus the origin. Um, so if I start at uh, some point and I do a loop like this red one, my eigenvalues will make a braid. It's a sort of, it's a pretty trivial braid. If I do a loop like this blue one that actually wraps around the whole, I will get the less trivial braid here. Okay. Um, but this space um, is uh, has as its fundamental group the integers. Um, so if I concatenate multiple loops, that's just the same thing as doing one loop with the total winding number. That's the same thing as saying that these braids commute with each other and that the geometry of the space is included. So as promised, the two-mode system, not that rich. Things change dramatically, though, when you go to more than two. So for the case of three modes, here's the most general characteristic polynomial of a traceless three by three matrix, where X and Y are just any complex numbers. So we're talking about a four-dimensional control space. Here's my best attempt at drawing four-dimensional Euclidean space. It'll be good enough, I think. Now I want to know where are the degeneracies, because I want to carve them out and then ask what kinds of loops can live in the remainder. Well, one degeneracy that's easy to spot is that both these x and y coefficients are zero. Then I just have three eigenvalues that are zero. That's a triple degeneracy of this the origin. That's the only one of its kind. And yet, I know the degeneracies must be a two-dimensional space in this 4D space. So there must be a bunch of others. They are the twofold degeneracies, and it's not hard to find them. They occur whenever y and x stand in this relationship to each other. This is what's known as the discriminant of this polynomial. So I just have to ask, where in the space does this uh, result hold? <laughs> and the result is so amazing and so easy. I'm actually going to show you the algebra. It's like two lines of algebra. But I just want to make it clear this doesn't come out of a hat. This is not some super high-powered math or anything. I want to know where does this happen? In order to find that, let me write complex number X and Y not as Cartesian coordinates, but in polar coordinates here. And then for simplicity, let me just start by working on a three sphere of some radius epsilon. It doesn't matter what it is, one, two million, anything you want. When I'm working on this three sphere, uh, this relationship combined with this relationship fixes the magnitudes of these two complex numbers in terms of this radius of the sphere epsilon. It leaves unspecified their arguments, theta and pi. If I don't know what theta and pi are, those are two numbers that run from zero to two pi. That's the surface of a torus. So I have to ask where on the surface of this torus does this relationship hold? And you can see just by cubing this and squaring this, it holds when this angle is twice this angle is three times this angle. That means you have to wrap around twice this way and wrap around three times this way. It's this line here. That line is the trefoil line. Here, I just peeled it off the torus. So what we've just shown in a few lines of algebra is that quite generally, for any three-mode system, however you tune it, um, at any fixed distance from the origin, the two-fold degeneracies will constitute a trefoil line. And none of this hinged on my choice of the sphere radius. So if I chose a smaller sphere, I have a smaller trefoil knot, and a smaller sphere, this trefoil knot, and they sort of extrude down to this little point here. That's the two-dimensional surface of degeneracies in a three-mode coupled oscillator system. Uh, this has a name. This is called the topological cone of the trefoil line. And this has real consequences. Okay, it tells me that if I have a three-mode system and I hunt for the two-fold degeneracies, I literally see this trefoil knot in my data. And it tells me that when I do loops uh, of such a system, my eigenvalues will braid in a non-commutative way, um, depending on how my loop encircles this knot. Here's some different choices for encircling a knot. 
I can tell the story for n equals four, but I run out of visualization tools. I actually have no idea what it looks like. It is mathematically known that the degeneracies are a knot-like structure, a higher dimensional analog of a knot, and that the remaining space, its fundamental group is certainly the braid group over four elements, that's non-abelian, et cetera, et cetera. All these qualitative features uh, hold true. Okay, so this math has been known for a long time, uh, easily a hundred years. Um, and there is no reason for me as an experimentalist to go verify it. It's just true, it's just basic math. But what I would say, uh, if there are any funding uh, agencies in the room or anything like that, look, if someone comes to you and tells you that the most ubiquitous system in all of physics, the thing that we build a lot of things out of, has some really rich, elegant mathematical structure that has been underappreciated to date, it's worth just measuring it at least once to see it. Yeah. That's sort of the inspiration for the experiments. How should I measure it? It totally does not matter. This is true for every three oscillator system. If you have one of these sitting in the demonstration room back there, that's great. That'll totally do. They could be microwave cavities, they could be anything. Again, my claim is that when you tune their parameters and ask where in the space of those parameters do you find degeneracies, it will be on these uh, triplet lots. Um, what time did we start? Um, yeah. Okay, so it turns out the, mo the, the thing that we're going to use instead of this, these are a little dusty. And they're a little slow. We're going to use uh, just this drum head of silicon nitride. It's just the thing that vibrates. It's a square drum head, has lots of modes. Here are three of them. Those are going to be our three harmonic oscillators. Um, they are not very tunable. We cannot explore this space with them. We just get what we get. But to tune them, we put them inside of an optical cavity. Again, there's no reason to do this. This is just nice. It's just convenient. And we fill the optical cavity with laser light. And it turns out that the radiation pressure in that cavity is a really nice way of stiffening or softening those modes or coupling them together or dampening them more or less. It just works out really nicely. Um, so you can forget about the fact that there are a whole bunch of lasers, except that um, what it turns out is that if you send in three laser tones with some detuning relative to this cavity resonance, it turns out that there are three powers and they're common detuning, shift them all together in frequency. Those turn out to be four parameters that span the space of all the characteristic polynomials. They're linearly independent controls over the spectrum. At the end of the day, it involves lots of things, but don't worry about that. None of that matters. So what does the experiment look like? We have this membrane in there. We have its three modes. We pick some uh, settings for the control lasers, like this many microwatts and this detuning. None of that really matters. It's just tuned up in some way. And then we buzz, we shape this little memory at various frequencies and we see how much it resonates. And here's the resonance at one frequency, here's the resonance at this frequency, here's the resonance near this frequency. And then we just fit this to the equations of motion for three coupled oscillators. That fit is shown here uh, as the black lines. Um, and from that fit, it returns to us the eigenvalues, the resonance frequencies, which are basically the centers of these. And uh, that's the real part of the eigenvalue. The imaginary part of each eigenvalue is the line mode, it's the damping rate. So the fit returns those, and they are three complex numbers. They live in the plane. We record them, and then we move on. We change these settings and do this experiment again and record the next spectrum, and so on and so forth. So the first thing that we need to do is to convince ourselves that we're really spanning the space and that we know, uh, that we know what's going on. So the first thing that we'd like to do is to find that one point of threefold degeneracy. These are our control parameters. And they, uh, my argument was that they span the same space as the characteristic polynomial coefficients, which means there should be one point of threefold degeneracy. So what we do is we just raster these experimental parameters all around. Uh, for each measurement, at each point in the space, we record the spectrum. That spectrum is three points in the complex plane. And then we just write down the perimeter of the triangle formed by these three. That's a quantity that vanishes only when three eigenvalues are the same. So here's a plot of rastering around. At each point, we measure the three eigenvalues and plot as a color the perimeter of the triangle. Here's what it looks like when we move on these three planes. This is a four-dimensional space, so we left out one of the <laughs> planes. I can arrange them in 3D, as shown here, uh, or I can you know, pick any three of these. There are four ways to slice through here. I can pick any three of them and assemble them to show you 
what the data looks like and just it agrees with what we'd expect from the known properties of this optical cavity in the region. So from this, we conclude, yeah, there really is a threefold degeneracy somewhere near this point here. We don't care exactly where it is. All we want to do now is to go on to some surface that surrounds this point and look for the twofold degeneracies. And the claim is that they should constitute a trefoil model in that case. Okay. So to do that, uh, that's literally what we do. Um, rather than take data over a hypersphere, it's sort of nice to take data over a four-dimensional equivalent of a cube. Um, the, so the hypersurface uh, that bounds a cube um, can be thought of, uh, actually does consist of eight three-dimensional cubes. Um, this is shown uh, here just as a cartoon. We can understand what this looks like, though, in, in analogy to explaining to a two-dimensional friend what the surface of a box looks like by unfolding it into her plane. Um, the uh, surface of a four-dimensional hypercube consists of eight boxes arranged like this, but you have to remember that they're all touching in a funny way. And one nice way of picturing that is to take the central box, leave it in the center, stretch out these six boxes around it so they're all touching each other and the central box in a topologically faithful way, and the last box gets stretched out to infinity. The reason that we do this is just as a matter of practice, it's easiest for us to pick one experimental parameter and raster it, and then raster another, and then raster another in this Cartesian cubic way. So what I'll show you now is a video that illustrates that. We literally scan the three powers, say, while keeping the detunings fixed, and we take data throughout this cube, and then we scan some other parameters and scan some other parameters and scan some other parameters, but in such a way that they share certain faces in common, so that if you visualize it, we you know, do this in software, all those uh, cubes connect together in the fashion that's shown here. You can stitch them together and they form this kind of tesseract looking thing. And the nice, re the reason that it's nice to show this uh, three-dimensional hypersurface in this fashion is that each cube can be connected quite nicely to the experimental parameters that we actually vary, the three powers in the overall utility. So this is the uh, all that data, those eight cubes of data represented in that this way. Uh, these sheets show you where we've rastered densely and taken lots of data. Um, here's one such sheet uh, just shown uh, in two dimensions here. And what we do is at each point, we collect the eigenvalue spectrum and we convert it to its polynomial discriminant, which is very easy. This is a quantity, complex quantity that it vanishes at degeneracies. So here it is vanishing. Uh, and here it is with a vortex of its argument around there. So this tells us it's really the zero of a complex function. We uh, do some smoothing of that data so that we can run it through an image recognition software so that we don't you know, fool ourselves. Uh, that algorithm detects the degeneracy either as a vortex in the phase or a zero in the absolute value. And then we say, okay, at this point in this sheet, there was a twofold degeneracy. And we do that 30,000 times, filling out this space, and we keep track of where all those little degeneracies were, and here were they, here's where they are. So of the 30,000 spectra that we took, these are the 192 that, that where it was found to be a twofold degeneracy. And it's a little hard to see in a static view, but when I rotate, you can see that these trace out the form of a trefoil model. We're able to color them because each not every twofold degeneracy is different via a parameter that runs from zero to two pi, which probably is just better for me not to explain that. But you can really see that this red arm wraps around this blue arm and they form this trefoil arm. Here's the same thing, just in a more conventional kind of stereographic projection. Okay. So this is the first thing that I wanted to show you. That you take any three-mode system, it totally doesn't matter what it is. You explore the space of the parameters that control its spectrum, and you will find the twofold degeneracies live on a trefoil model. The other thing that I told you about was what happens if you tune your system around that uh, not shaped degeneracy. So here is that data that I showed you before. These are the locations of all the twofold degeneracies. This curve is the fitted uh, form. And now what I'm going to do is just uh, look at the spectrum as I step through our data set on this green loop. And I'm just going to plot the eigenvalue spectrum for you. In our data set, it turns out we had about 20 spectra reported on this green loop here. And here they are, 20 of them plotted, stacked on top of each other. This is the complex plane, three eigenvalue spectra, step, 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 step. Here's what they do. They make a break. Not a very interesting break, but it's not a very interesting loop. Here's the theory. 
So let me now show you uh, the same thing. This is spectra reported on this loop that you can see wraps around one of the strands of the knot. And here's what those eigenvalues do. They definitely start with a certain spectrum and end up with a certain spectrum, the same spectrum, but they get there uh, by a non-trivial break. And if we do a loop that wraps around the knot in an even more fancy way, we get an even fancier break. This is a very robust feature of the data. This is not, you don't need to cherry pick. You can go in and just draw all kinds of crazy loops. Like this loop is topologically distinct from the ones I showed you. It's distinct from this one. It's distinct from this one. And you get all these different braids. The very last thing that I told you uh, was that um, because of the geometry of a three-dimensional space with a trefoil knot carved out of it, loops in that space do not commute with each other. This is a space with a non-abelian fundamental loop. And you can just see that in the data. I mean, I can tell you this space has that property, but here it actually is in the eigenvalue spectrum. I start with this black point. I know it looks like it's right on the knot, but that's just sort of perspective. And I look at the spectrum as I go first around the red loop and then around the blue loop. And here's what that data looks like. And then I show you exactly the same data, just doing the blue stuff first and then the red stuff. This is a totally different break. You can see that because like this middle eigenvalue ends up on the left over here, but over here, it ends up on the right. So this, uh, so loops in this space do not commute with each other. And that's a consequence, if you like, because of the geometry uh, of these degeneracies. So that's uh, everything that I was gonna tell you about. Um, so just by way of conclusion and summary, uh, again, if you just take away a couple things here, doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what system you're talking about. If you have more than two oscillators, and you uh, tune its spectrum in every way that you can, you will find that the degeneracies live on some kind of knot. You'll find that the res the spectrum of resonances trace out a braid, and you will find that if you do loops in this space, they do not commute with each other. And that's uh, in this data here. If you want sort of a more uh, formal mathematical statement, uh, here it is. Um, in terms of next steps, I'm about to show a, a slide thanking everyone and mentioning that there are postdoc positions available. So I might as well say something about what's going on next or uh, as we speak. You know, all this stuff, which makes some nice pictures and an interesting story, I hope, had nothing to do with dynamics, has nothing to do with F equals MA. This is just how the eigenvalues of a matrix change as you change that matrix. Okay? So there's nothing in, in this all these measurements about real time evolution. Um, so that's what we're starting to explore now. And in particular, we're interested in what happens if you try to use this braid structure to influence the time evolution of such a system. And to just be concrete about that, let me sketch it out this way, cartoon-wise. Suppose you start with your control parameters set somehow, and you have such and such a spectrum. And then what you do is you actually drive your system. You put energy in one of these modes, like that one. And then as a function of time, you change your control parameters. Um, now, uh, I can tell you what the spectrum does along this loop. It traces out this kind of break. If I could appeal to the adiabatic theorem, like I can in Hermitian systems, I would suppose that if I did this loop very slowly, my excitation would just be transported along the eigenstates, the eigenmode that is smoothly connected to the original one and would end up here. Well, that would be a little bit amusing. But the reason that this is super interesting, I think, is that if I ask what happens when I do a different control loop, like this red one that encircles degeneracies differently, starting with the same spectrum, preparing the same state, I would evolve to a completely different final state. So this would be a topological outcome for control. Loop. The only thing that the output of your control loop cares about is its topology, very robust against errors, mistakes, and things like that. Uh, this is not going to work, as described, for a very important reason. There is no adiabatic theorem once you turn off the hermeticity of the matrix. So you cannot prepare a state, go super slowly, and expect it to follow like this. It would be so cool if it did. On the other hand, um, uh, adiabaticity is like the world's worst control scheme. Right? You have to go super slow. And there are a lot of clever tricks that are known both in Hermitian systems and in non-Hermitian systems that allow you to go, let's say, faster or to break the rules of adiabaticity and still transport a state along the smoothly connected uh, eigenstate. So we're starting to learn about ways of applying these ideas of shortcuts to adiabaticity and counter-diabatic driving to produce exactly this kind of dynamics. 
The other thing we're interested in uh, is not just the transport of energy, like this mode is excited, and then at the end of the day, this one's excited, but to keep track of the phase of these oscillators. Um, and so we've also been learning about the uh, way that geometric phase or Berry phase is manifest in such systems. Uh, we have some measurements on that. If you're interested, I can uh, I can show them to you offline. Uh, but for now, let me just uh, stop here and thank our funding sources, folks who work in the lab, our theory colleagues, and uh, just mention that we have positions open uh, on this project. And thank you very much for listening. We have time for some several questions. Around the point for the eigenvalues cross, I would expect you know those are what they call exceptional points that are related to them that they're difficult to measure because they're unstable and they pop around and things like that. Is that observed or be? Yeah, so let me clarify a few points. So I deliberately do not use the word exceptional point here because um, it doesn't matter. This is only a, everything that I've talked about here has to do with the spectrum. Uh, and an exceptional point uh, is about uh, the matrix and what happens to its eigenvectors. Do they coalesce, so to speak? Is the geometric degeneracy different from the algebraic degeneracy? None of that matters for telling this entire story. This entire story is just a story about how the scalar quantities, the roots of polynomials, depend on parameters. Um, so we don't have to bring exceptional points into the discussion. But I will tell you that, yes, these are generically going to be exceptional points. Um, and um, you, and so as exceptional points, um, no, they don't. You know, they're not particularly unstable. Uh, so what do you mean by that? Well, degenerate roots typically like, are numerically unstable in polynomials. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I were to, like, imagine that I really tuned up my system and done some measurements and found the degeneracy, and then someone came in and bumped the table, and tweak some parameter, that degeneracy would move by a certain amount. Um, and I don't think that that degeneracy moves, and I think that's just linear in small perturbations. What's not linear is if I sit at this point and then step away from it, the separation of my roots will grow like square root, and that's sort of the stronger scaling that sometimes of interest. But no, there's no instability or anything like that. It's, you know, if you bump the experiment a lot, it will not be repeatable or stable, but there's no, no intrinsic instability. And it's unstable in a very forgiving way. Like if you, uh, if you, if we, so this data took 100 days to acquire. It's so embarrassing because we just had to spend all that time rastering through this space, collecting all the spectra, fitting it. Um, this experiment was not optimized to do that quickly. We now know how to do that. But uh, if somebody were to have bumped the table very violently and we had to retake that, we, you do know just from the basic math that it would still contain a trefoil line. It would just be a little bit smushed compared to the old one. Because this is a generic feature of such systems. Are there other questions? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the really nice talk. Um, maybe I missed this, but where exactly does the non hermeticity of that matrix? Uh, generate these phase. Oh, uh, it's it's uh, because it is what lets the eigenvalues live in a plane. If your matrix is Hermitian, your eigenvalues live on a real on the real number line, and they literally cannot braid. There's no way for them to get around each other. So a set has to get smoothly transported back to itself. Each element will be transported smoothly back to itself, just because there's no other way they can't get past each other. So you have to put the numbers on a plane. For them to even think about raising. Um, is it possible to generate other types of nodes than just three points? Um, I don't know. So if, for a three mode, for, so for a third order polynomial, um, the uh, degenerate roots just lie on the trefoil nut. Um, for a fourth order polynomial, all the dimensions go up. Um, and I don't know uh, what they would lie on. If there are any mathematicians here, geometers, I would love to know if there's some sort of famous known result about this. Um, I just don't know what those higher order equivalents look like. They have the same properties in terms of the fundamental group, blah, 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 but I just, I don't know what they look like. But if you take a slice to one of these higher dimensional geometries, do you get them all? I, uh, uh, I think generically, yes, but I don't know which one. And if anybody knows more about this topic, uh, I would love to 
have some guidance. Um, what happens if you move along the uh, the cone of the track that last? Oh, if you were to take this data. Yeah, so this data um, is on the surface that surrounds the triple degeneracy. And I can't visualize that because of my three dimensional brain, but it turns out in this case, it's pretty easy to draw this, that three dimensional hollow surface as apparently filling this thing in a nice um, topologically honest way. Um, if I were to have instead done it on a box that was this big, it would look qualitatively exactly the same. It would still be a trefoil model. Um, yeah, qualitatively, it would be exactly the same. So, yeah. I Maybe I took your cartoon too seriously, but on those spheres that you're drawing yep. the surfaces, yep. where does the truffle knot actually live? Is it, is it actually localized along? Like, is there some? Can you can you use this theory to like bound the region over which you can have degeneracy? Um, so let me just answer your first question. It's the tuple degeneracies live on a two dimensional surface, which I cannot picture in three dimensional space. I have to take a trefoil knot, which I can picture, and then extrude it down to a point without it crossing itself. This I can't picture in three dimensions, but that is what happens. Um, that's what these little green dashed lines are meant to indicate. So, you know, like if I were to take a circle and extrude it down to a point, that's an ice cream cone. And if I were to take, a, but there are but shapes like this, I can't, uh, can't readily visualize. It's a perfectly well defined thing. If I'm thinking of an open quantum system, you can try to find it's not yet. We have some additional structure at the spectrum. I mean, the, the, the eigenvalues which have a complex part, they are conjugates or okay. so you So, can you still have this interesting gradient structure with this additional structure? I would love for someone to look at this carefully. So, the way I would pose that is when I showed you that list of like quantum mechanics and classical mechanics and blah, blah, blah. Um, if you're doing quantum mechanics with closed systems, you restrict that matrix to be Hermitian. If you're doing Lindbladian's open system, you restrict that matrix not to be Hermitian, but so that it's exponent is completely positive trace preserving. That's still a restricted class. And I don't know if it can realize all characteristic polynomials. If it can realize, if it's sufficiently unrestricted that it can realize arbitrary characteristic polynomials, um, then you would definitely have all of them. Uh, but I would love for someone who knows open one of systems to, um, uh, yeah, I'd love any guidance on that. Thank you for the great talk. Um, the um, experimental experiments you did, I assume, were quite low, very low temperature. Do you, do you expect that the topological behavior would be preserved as you went to higher temperature? Absolutely. So this this has nothing to do with temperature. Uh, like it's just again, like if we had the demonstration with the three pendulums coupled here, we could take all this data. Um, you might have seen that there was a cryostat in the picture. It was done at low temperature just for technical reasons. So it took a hundred days. And the thing that we were fighting, in addition to like boredom and things like that, uh, on the uh, was just that everything drifts. And so, like, you take data in a certain part of that test rack, and then you take go somewhere else, and then you come back, and all oh, wasn't the same. Uh, having things in a cryostat just made everything super stable. Uh, that's the only role the temperature plays. Very good. That's the last question. Okay. It may sound funny, but uh, what's this good? <laughs> um, you said it in the nicest part. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I would uh, put on my uh, you know sciences hat and say again, look, almost everything that you build or that you think about is constructed out of coupled oscillators, whether it's field theory or LIGO. You build a lot of coupled oscillators, and you want to know how they work. And the fact that there is and let's say underappreciated mathematical structure in that is important. Like we should know this. Um, I'm not a business person. I haven't started a company. But what I would say is like if it's useful for something, um, I'm intrigued by this idea here that you can take uh, systems like this and use, let's say, uh, something like adiabatic control to realize a topological control, topological outcomes for <coughs> closed loop operations. I think that probably 